Well, welcome everyone. Let's begin our gathering music. It is number 26A. a couple of announcements. Uh, one of them is, of course, we're going away. I guess everybody here knows that. For uh, We'll be gone all the Sundays in August, and then I'll have to quarantine when I get back as well, uh, probably, unless they change that. But uh, Henry Barch is going to be here for all the five Sundays in August. And so um, we're looking forward to having him come. He really he is really looking forward to being with the congregation here. Um, he had an opportunity to maybe do a pulpit exchange while he was here, and he said no, he didn't want to do that. He wanted to be all, all five here. He's going to do a, a series on Job for the main service, and then a series on the Trinity for the one that is usually our catechism service. Um, <clears throat> good news, too. Uh, the session met with uh, Joanna Bigney. And we received her to, uh, as a communicant member. So we're very thankful for that. And we also met that same night with um, Manel Christian. That was on Tuesday. And we have uh, recommended that he come under care of the Presbytery as a student of gospel ministry. And uh, the Presbytery will have to decide that, the committee first and then the Presbytery. So he has to give his uh, sense of call and all that to a bunch of people before he's finally approved. And they may, it's always possible they could say that he could wait a little bit because of um, normally you don't become a student of ministry until you're actually in um, the, the divinity program. But the reason we're doing it a little sooner is because we want to look at some of the education requirements for him um, just in his situation. So anyway, but it was, it's a wonderful thing. He gave a great testimony of his call, his sense of call, and it was very uh, encouraging to us. So pray for him. I'm going to miss him a lot, though. He's not going to be here when I get back, so, so we're going to be gone. All right, well, uh, I believe that's all the announcements that I have. So please stand for the call to worship. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song in his praise in the assembly of saints. Let Israel rejoice in their maker. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the humble with salvation. Let's look to our God in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are so very thankful that we can come before you now and that we can call on your name. And Father, that we do have a new song to sing in the assembly of the saints. Lord, truly a new song is a song of deliverance. It's one that we sing of testifying of your faithfulness and how you have delivered us as your people. 
And we thank you, Lord, that we have great reason to rejoice because you are our king and you have delivered us from, from so great a peril as our own sin and the guilt that we have incurred through that. We know, Lord, that in Adam that all die and that in our first father, Adam, that, that we all sinned when he sinned. He represented us all. And we became repugnant, obnoxious. We became unclean in your sight so that there was no way that we could be ever righteous by our own efforts or labor. We were condemned and undone. But we thank you that in your great mercy that you had purposed even from before the foundation of the world that you would bring forth your son, that he would be born of flesh and that he would come to represent a new people that he was given, a people that would be a kingdom of righteousness, ones that were reconciled and restored to you. We thank you that he himself was faithful, that unlike Adam who sinned in paradise, that the Lord Jesus did not sin in this fallen world. And even when he had to go all the way to the cross in order to bear our sins, if he was indeed going to make a kingdom of righteousness here, it could be no kingdom of righteousness without an atoning sacrifice and only one who is both God and man could make that sacrifice. We thank you that he came and that he did that and that because of him, we're able to come before you and worship you. We would not dare to come before you if Christ had not come. We would not be able to stand before you. And we thank you, Lord, that now we can come boldly because we are reconciled to you by the blood of the covenant. We pray, Lord, then that you would fill us with gratitude and that you would help us to worship you. <clears throat> we thank you, Lord, that in our redemption, it's not only the forgiveness of sins. It's not just the forgiveness of sins. That would do us a little good if we were still the way we are without any hope of change. We thank you, Lord, that you also, by Christ, have given us the Holy Spirit to cleanse us to renew our hearts, to change us so that we would come to you in the first place, come to Christ for salvation, even want to come, want to be reconciled to you in the first place. And then also that after we are reconciled, that we could begin to live for you and bring forth fruit that is pleasing to you. It's a kind of an amazing thing to see that in this call to worship that it says that you take pleasure in your people. And sometimes we find that a hard thing to, to believe but we know that your word says it and that it's true and that even whatever fruit that we may bring forth, however meager it may be, that you are pleased with that fruit. And we pray that we would remember that and that coming before you, we would desire that the spirit would blow upon us that that, that, that fruit might be, might be something that uh, is, is, the fragrance is carried along that that our graces might be in exercise for people to see and for you to see. And we pray that you would receive our worship and that you would receive us. And we pray that you would strengthen us with the means of grace as well, that we might bear more fruit, that we might become a fountain of living water that will be a blessing to others, that your spirit working in us, Lord, would be that which brings life to those who are in the wilderness and that sustains life for those who are already your people. Thank you, Lord, for all that you have done for us, for our Lord Jesus Christ. We do pray today for those that are bearing trials and afflictions. We pray that you would give them patience under their afflictions, help them to trust you as a faithful Savior, help them to know that you do not afflict them without cause, help them to rest in, your, in the hope that, that you will bring forth good out of it, we pray, Lord, that you, would help, um, that you would help them also not to become bitter or impatient under their trials, but that they would wait upon you. Lord, thank you for all that you've done for us. We do pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you look in the bulletin, there's a confession of rejoicing there printed for you. This is the one that we did last week as well. It's very suitable to what we're looking at presently from Isaiah 61. And here we confess that we know that we're going to rejoice 
we believe that we're going to rejoice because of uh, God's promises and His salvation that doesn't depend on us, but it depends on Christ. So we have an assurance and a certainty, don't we? So we confess to God, that, who has clothed us with righteousness, that, uh, that we will rejoice. So let's, uh, as God's people, we're assembled and we, together we profess, I, greatly, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its bud, as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. Now let's sing Psalm 92C. Psalm 92C is one where we rejoice that we're able to bear fruit in the house of God. And we look to him to, to work in us. We thank him for what he has done. And uh, we talk about how those that are planted in the Lord do thrive and bear fruit. It's a song, a song for the Sabbath day, 92C. Please be seated. Our New Testament scripture reading is from Revelation chapter 21. We have read this one before in connection with the Song of Solomon. It is very much related to it because it talks about the bride and her uh, union with Christ. And of course, we've seen that she's a complicated bride. She's uh, one that is made up of multiple um, members. She has, she's a bride with many members that uh, make her up, all those who are redeemed in Christ. And so John has to go up on a high place to see the whole bride as she comes down from heaven adorned for her husband. And she becomes the place where he dwells. And we see that there is a kind of a, a restoration, there is a restoration of uh, paradise and there's a building scene, but then there's also a garden scene that we're going to read the first five verses of chapter 22, and there are trees and rivers of water, 
things like that that um, are, are there for God's people. So we look forward very much to, um, to being with Christ at this great wedding feast that's coming, this great day when we will be brought to him. So listen now as I read this to you. This is Revelation 21, 1 is where I start. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven for God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will, I will give of the fountain of water of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Also, she had a great and high wall with twelve gates and twelve angels at the gates, and names written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. Now the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he who taught with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth, and he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. Then he measured its wall, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man, that, that is, of an angel. The construction of its wall was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundation of the wall of the city were, I'm sorry, the foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, and the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each individual gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no more night there. <clears throat> and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. But there shall by no means enter anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. And he showed me a pure river of wa the water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the, the river was the tree of life, which bore the twelve fruits, each yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for healing of the nations, 
and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They, shall, there, they need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And there I'll end the reading of God's holy word. Now let's continue our singing of praise with the singing of Psalm 1a. And uh, this song, of course, talks about the righteous man. And uh, we know that we all come short of meditating on God's law day and night and not walking the counsel of ungodly and all, all the things that are said here. But we also know that, as I said in my prayer, that our righteousness is in Jesus Christ. And he's the one that we trust in because he is righteous and he has procured righteousness for sinners like us who, who trust in him. So therefore, we can sing this song as one who in him is righteous. We can sing it with rejoicing and hope and know that we'll be like a tree that is planted by the water that brings forth much fruit. So let's sing this together, 1A. So you can turn in your Bible to Song of Solomon, chapter 4. I believe most of you were here last week, so you'll remember that I preached a sermon about how Jesus is ravished with us if we are believers because we make up his bride and he is ravished with his delight in his bride. It was from chapter 4 in the Song of Solomon, that uh, the book that we're going through now, of course. One of the things I showed you is the way Jesus says that even one little look of devotion that comes from his bride is enough to ravish his heart, um, to unheart him. The, uh, it says in 4.9, you have ravished, he says to his bride, you have ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse, you have ravished my heart with one look of your eyes. Now, many who read such words in the Song of Songs are uncomfortable with the traditional interpretation of the Song of Songs about Jesus and that it's about Jesus and his love for the church as his bride. Love like that seems alien to many modern Christians. Our Lord Jesus is simply not someone they know in that way or think of in that way as being ravished with love for his people, for what he sees in them. This is, in fact, a sad characteristic of the modern church, that we don't know Jesus as one who cherishes his people 
and is enraptured with them. That's one of the reasons I especially wanted to expound this book to you, because it's something that is missing, so that you would learn to know our Lord in this way that is one of the ways that He's revealed. I have shown you all along that you can't get away with writing this perspective of Jesus off simply by saying, well, that is just one way of interpreting the Song of Solomon. I mean, it is true that for the last century or two, there have been a lot of preachers who have denied that the Song of Songs is about the relationship of Jesus and his bride, the church. And you could use that to argue that the way it was almost always interpreted by the church was, was wrong you know, the, over, over those years. You, you could do that. Say, oh, they've discovered this or that or whatever. But if you do that because you're uncomfortable with thinking of Jesus as one who would be pleased to have his love compared to the love of a man for his bride, you can't do that because it's very clear that he does do that. You can't get away with it, at least not if you believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. There are passages in God's word and his word cannot be broken, that expressly tell us that he does, in fact, love, love us with a cherishing love like that. Now, you understand why I call it a cherishing love. Um, you could have love for someone that you really don't care about, but that you want to do them good. But this is a cherishing love, the kind that you have for someone that you actually delight in that we're talking about here, that you, you're rab- your heart is ravished with them. So, um, passage in scripture that's a great example that we've looked at several times that really corresponds with the Song of Solomon is Isaiah uh, 62, 5. It says, for as a young man marries a virgin, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. So there you have it in straight words. The same way that a young man rejoices over his bride, is the way that God rejoices over his people. In the New Testament, we are told how Jesus and his Father delight in the fruit that we bear, that it pleases them. We're told how at the last day we'll be presented to Jesus as his bride without spot or blemish, and how he will bring us into his Father's house with great joy, and how he will show us the love that he and the Father have had from all eternity, and how he will bring us into that love so that we will share in that love, both receiving and giving that love. If we are to know our Lord as he is revealed in the scripture, then we need to know him in this way because it's clear that this is what he's like. Surely his love is demonstrated in what he did for us in order that he might have us as his bride. How for the joy that was set before him, that he endured the cross even though he despised the shame, that he might purge our sins and bring us to himself without spot or blemish. Remember with uh, Jacob when he wanted to to marry Rachel and he had the extra, he had the seven years that he had to work first. And he, uh, it was a very short time to him because he was so, even though there was a, a burden that he had to bear, he did it gladly because of the joy of having her, anticipation of having her as his wife. So having seen last week that our Lord is ravished with us if we are his true church, I want to move on now and show you how glad we ought to be and how glad we will be to have him cherishing us. The passage I began last week continues on from where we were and and really brings this out. We pick up today at 412, Song of Solomon chapter 4, verse 12. But for the sake of the context, I will begin reading in verse 1, and then you can see for yourself how he begins telling us how delighted he is with us, and then uh, we see how our devotion to him and our desire, or he delights in our devotion to him, and and, um, we see our desire to give ourselves to him. That's that's what we see uh, today, the desire that we have to, to give ourselves to the one who delights in us. So here is God's word, beginning in Psalm of Solomon 4.1. Behold, you are fair, my love. Behold, you are fair. You have dove's eyes behind your veil. Your hair is like a flock of goats going down from Mount Gilead. 
Your teeth are like a flock of shorn sheep, which have come up from the washing, every one of which bears twins, and none is barren among them. Your lips are like a strand of scarlet, and your mouth is lovely. Your temples behind your veil are like a piece of pomegranate. Your neck is like the tower of David built for an armory, on which hang a thousand bucklers and shields of mighty men. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle which feed among the lilies. Until the day breaks and the shadows flee away, I will go my way to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. You are all fair, my love, and there is no spot in you. Come with me from Lebanon, my spouse, with me from Lebanon. Look from the top of Amana, from the top of Sinar and Hermon, from the lion's dens, from the mountains of the leopards. You have ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. You have ravished my heart with one look of your eyes. With one link of your necklace, how fair is your love, my sister, my spouse. How much better than wine is your love, and the scent of your perfumes than all spices. Your lips, O my spouse, drip as the honeycomb, honey and milk are under your tongue. And the fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. A garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse, a spring shut up, a fountain sealed. Your plants are an orchard of pomegranates with pleasant fruits, fragrant henna with spikenard, spikenard with saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with all trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes, with all the chief spices, a fountain of gardens, a well of living waters, and streams from Lebanon. Awake, O north wind, and come, O south. Blow upon my garden that spices may flow out. Let my beloved come to his garden and eat its pleasant fruits. I have come to my garden, my sister, my spouse. I have gathered my myrrh with my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I have drunk my wine with my milk. Eat, O friends. Drink, yes, drink deeply, O beloved ones. May the Lord bless the reading and preaching of his holy word. We may summarize the whole of this under three headings that we have uh, to, to look at today. First, in verses 12 through 15, he tells us here that we are his garden and his fountain. And then in verse 16, we respond with a strong desire to give ourselves completely to him. We are his. We want to give ourselves to him. And in chapter 5, verse 1, he assures us that uh, he has already uh, been enjoying our fruits. So let's consider each of these divisions more fully, beginning with the first. In verses 12 through 15, he tells us that we are his own garden in his own fountain. Now you can see how we are said to be both a garden and a fountain in verse 12. A garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse, a spring shut up, a fountain sealed. Now, I found when I was studying this that there were many interpreters who wanted to say that the bride is a garden that is supplied by a fountain. But that's not actually what it says here. It's certainly true that when we are in Christ, he baptizes us with the Holy Spirit, who is signified by water baptism, and the Spirit is to us like a fountain of water, John the Baptist said of Christ, I will baptize you with water, but he, Jesus, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. God explained to us in Ezekiel 36, 25, that when he gathered his people to salvation, he would sprinkle clean water on them and they would be clean. But whatever water baptism is the symbol, but the cleansing that's accomplished is not the washing of our bodies, of course, but it's the washing and renewing and regeneration of the Holy Spirit. So it is that which the Lord does, it's that which the Lord goes on to describe in Ezekiel 36, verse 26. He describes that this washing that the Spirit does, what is the effect of that? He describes it as giving us a new heart, of putting a new spirit within us, of taking away the heart of stone and giving us a heart of flesh, a responsive, a heart that is responsive to God. This, he says in verse 27, will be accomplished by putting the Holy Spirit in us, within us, with the result that 
we will walk in his statutes and keep his judgments to do them. In other words, we will become his disciples. That's how we're saved, isn't it? We believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we repent of our sins, we come to follow him, and we walk with him as our savior. We come to learn, we're baptized, and then we come to learn all that he has commanded us. We will come to him then for forgiveness and life. The Spirit, Jesus says, convicts us of sin and causes us to see that we are condemned. It shows us what God's true righteousness is, and it shows us that Jesus is the Savior that we, we need, who is the Savior that is all that we need, that is just right for us, so that we come believing on the Lord Jesus. Jesus refers to this giving to us of the Spirit as giving us living water so that we never thirst. He explains that the water will be like a fountain in us that will flow from our inmost being like a river of life. We're going to talk about it a little more later. He calls this being born of the Spirit and being baptized by the Spirit. And he says that no one, unless they're born of the Spirit, can see the kingdom of God. They cannot have eternal life. So it is true that the Lord Jesus provides water for his bride, not denying that at all, without which she would be dead. She would be a barren wilderness with no fruit and no life whatsoever. But that's not what he's describing in the Song of Songs, uh, chapter 4, verses 12 through 15, when he talks about a fountain in the garden. The emphasis here is on the fruit and the water that come from us. We are, in other words, both his garden that produces fruit and his fountain that, that, that um, produces fresh water. We are both a fountain and a garden. So you see what I'm saying? It's not that we're a garden that has a fountain in it that supplies us, but we are both the garden and the fountain according to what it says in our text. You can see that verse 13 and 14 speak of the produce that comes from us as a garden, while verse 15 speaks of us as a source of water. So let's look at these. Verse 13 and 14 tells of the produ of produce that is exceptional. It's very desirable and it's very pleasing kind of uh, fruit. In fact, the word that's translated orchard there, when it says your plants are an orchard, is a Persian loan word that actually means paradise. Isn't that interesting? Step back and consider, well, Jesus is saying that our garden, that we're a garden, and that this garden is a paradise to him. I remind you that we have already seen, it fits with what we've already seen, that he is ravished with our love, with one glance from us of affection and tenderness, you know, of, of delight in him, of faith, um, all of those things. It's... it's um, it, it takes his heart. We've already seen that our love is something that is indeed a fruit of his saving work and that he says is better than wine. So you see how the fruits then are described here in verse 13 and 14. Your plants are an orchard or a paradise of pomegranates with pleasant fruits, fragrant henna with spikenard, spikenard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with all trees of frankincense, myrrh, and aloes, with all the chief spices. Now, many of these, quite a few of these, are rare spices that only the super rich could afford. We have already seen some of these that are spoken of and how they were cherished and prized by those who are able to have the privilege of, of having them. Saffron is mentioned here for the first and only time. And it's used to produce a fragrant oil that, like some of the other things we've seen, that required 4,000 blossoms per ounce of oil. So there was a great deal of labor required to, um, to produce this fragrance. We do not need to go into all the details on each of these things. The point is that Jesus views his church, his bride, as a garden that brings forth precious fruit, fruit that is not just found everywhere, something very extraordinary that is highly valued. But what is this fruit from the analogy? 
Well, principle among it all is love, something we may think to be very common with our superficial observation. We say, oh yeah, everybody knows about love. Yet, we are told in Scripture that no one has ever loved unless they are born of God. So we're talking about not something like a, a kind of a imitation love that looks like love, a counterfeit kind of love. We're talking about the real thing that's a fruit that we only have from God. Love for the Father, love for Christ, and true love for our neighbor is something that became non-existent in the world because of the fall. It has the same cheap substitutes that claim to be the true item, just the way that these spices have their cheap substitutes that claim to be the the real item. But the real love that Christ cherishes is extremely rare. It is found only in those who have come to Christ for salvation. Those who are the true bride who realize that salvation is needed and who know that salvation can only be found in Him. They're the only ones. Besides love, there is joy and peace and patience and kindness, goodness, self-control. All these are precious and rare and found in their true form only in the people of God. They are pomegranate, they are the pomegranates, henna, spikenard, saffron, calmus, and cinnamon that grow in Christ's bride, his true church, the garden. And the reason that the others are not the genuine article is because they're not rooted and grounded in the Creator, and they're not directed toward Him. And so to love anything without loving God is to miss the whole point, the whole mark, or to have joy in anything without joy in God is to corrupt the whole thing so that it's no longer a virtue, but actually a vice. To our Lord Jesus, then, where he sees these fruits in their true expression, it is to him a garden of paradise. We were made in his image to start with, And we know how when we were created that God declared that it was very good after man was created. And uh, this was the the pinnacle of his creation. The, the, The high point of creation was man made in his image. God delighted in that, that we were going to, we were made to be a reflection of, of God and who he is as creatures that he had made. And he had great delight in us. The angels rejoiced when God created us. We were made in his image, but of course we fell into corruption and defilement. And his bride is the one that he has brought forth now out of that fallen, ruined mass, brought forth by his power to be renewed in his image again in knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. For him, she is a garden of paradise, a garden of Eden, the holy of holies where he delights to dwell. And somehow the way that we're made as creatures, we have this, um, this freedom and so forth where we can, um, you know, uh, go, go this way or that way as it were. We don't, we're not like robots that are just doing things and we don't know what we're doing. We know what we're doing. We do things deliberately. And so in order to bring us to the place where we had a depth of love and the true love that, that we need to have in the way that we were created... God, God brings lessons to us that come only through the fall and through all of the uh, different things that we experience. Having, for us to really understand what he's like, we needed to see his grace redeeming sinners. And we needed to see him sending sinners to hell. And uh, we wouldn't really know his character in the kind of creatures we are. We were, we were creatures that were made who need to be educated, and, and by God, he, he reveals his glory to us. This is how he has chosen to work in his wisdom. So that there's this kind of a, a divine working that goes on. Verse 15 describes now the bride of Jesus, his church as a fountain of water. So you see, she is, um, we've seen that she was a, um, a garden But now we see in verse 15, her as a fountain of water. It says, a fountain of gardens, a well of living waters and streams from Lebanon. So you see that she's not only a fountain, but also a well and a stream. 
by his saving work, she has become a source of blessing, a fountain of blessing to others. Jesus describes this marvelous quality in which we are said to actually become a source of water in John 7, 37. He says, on the last day, that great day of the feast, it tells us, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. So Jesus is where we get the water of the Holy Spirit. He says, he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So he comes to Jesus as the source, and then he becomes himself a source. And out of him goes rivers of living water. It says, but this he spoke concerning the spirit whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. What happened at Pentecost when the Spirit was poured out? The disciples, the apostles, who were completely incapable of being a fountain of water that would give life to anyone, when filled with the Spirit, were now able to go out and preach the gospel so that many people believed, even that very day. By the work of the Holy Spirit, then we, Christ's bride, have become a life-giving source of refreshment that brings life to the barren wilderness whether it be a believer that has gone into a wilderness time that we are able to encourage with God's grace, or whether it be uh, that we bring, um, we, we bring the gospel to someone who does not know the Lord at all. The Bible actually speaks of two ways that we bring forth fruit that are reflected in these two things, the garden and the water. The fruits of the Spirit that I spoke about before, love, joy, peace, patience, and so on, uh, the, the, they, they are the produce of the garden, Okay, what, what comes out of us is a garden, what grows in us is a garden. But also, we are said to produce fruit when we lead others to Christ. And then through our encouragement and ministry to them are used to help them to bring forth fruit. And to, um, we water them so that they come to life in the first place, and then they grow. So we're channels of living water, as it were, a source of life is those who minister to one another in Christ our husband by the Spirit. Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit without measure, but we also have an anointing from the Holy One. The living water then flows out of us to bring life to the dead and to sustain each other in those who have been made alive. God uses us, in other words. Isn't that the two kinds of fruit that it talks about? Like the fruit of making disciples and the fruit of things growing like a garden in you. The water and the garden. Those are the two things. So we're here said to be a water source in three ways. A fountain of gardens, we are called. We cause other members who, are, who make up the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, to bear fruit by supplying them with water like a fountain. Then we're a well of living waters. We are a place where water can be drawn by those who are in need. In other words, they can come looking for water and seeking water. And then where streams from Lebanon, a source of flowing refreshment that reaches others. Again, the details here are not so important. The point is that Jesus delights in us as a fountain, as a well, as a stream that gives life to his elect and that sustains them as the Holy Spirit, who is the water, uses us as members of his body. But there is an emphasis about the garden and the fountain that we have not even touched on yet. Notice that the garden is said to be enclosed. Did you notice that? A spring shut up, it says. It really emphasizes it. And a fountain sealed. We haven't talked about that yet. Christ emphasizes this about his bride in verse 12. A garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse. A spring shut up, a fountain sealed. Now, this almost seems to contradict what we just looked at. We saw the bride as a garden who's bringing forth fruit, which obviously people would enjoy. And we saw her as having a river of water flowing out of her to give life to the nations. Yet here she is said to be closed up, shut up. The word in the original Hebrew translated enclosed can actually be also translated locked or even barred. So this hardly sounds like one who is a source 
of um, a, a source of, of the water to anyone except Christ. It's his garden and his spring, and it's all, all closed up. And indeed, the emphasis here is, in fact, that she is for him alone. But we're perhaps looking at the wrong thing that is for him alone. The bride is a garden and a fountain that is exclusively for her husband. What is this? This is a beautiful picture of fidelity, purity, and chastity. So she is faithful, in other words, to her husband, like a pure virgin bride. She is no adulteress. She is no harlot. Her fruit and her fountain are for her husband and no other. This is a beautiful portrayal of holiness. We have been restored to the Lord. We have turned from idols to serve the living God. No longer giving our allegiance and devotion and service to idols, but now we've been brought to Christ. Remember, we've talked about Ephraim and Hosea and how he said, what do I have to do with idols anymore? Because he had been restored to the Lord. Why would I serve idols when I have Christ as my husband? We have come to Christ. We're his and he is ours. So holiness means that we're set apart to God. We're sanctified to him. Anything that was holy was devoted to use for, of, of, to God's use. It means that everything we do is aimed at pleasing Him now. That's what we should have been doing all along when we, we were created in holiness and then we fell. But we're brought back to that where our life becomes again about pleasing Him. So it means that everything we do is aimed at that. As 2 Corinthians 5, 9 says, we make it our aim whether present or absent, he's talking about whether we're in the body or out of the body after we're in the intermediate state, but we make it our aim to be well-pleasing to him. Not just pleasing, but well-pleasing. I wonder if that's, uh, if that's what you do. Is that how you make decisions? That What will please the Lord? Is that the way you live your life? How can I please the Lord? Or are you just like, looking for other, other things? Like what, will, what do I think will make me happy? Or what will... What do I not like? What do I like? What do I want to do? You know, that kind of thing. We have taken, uh, as the bride of Christ, you see, who are, who are set apart to him, we've taken Paul's prayer in Colossians 1, 9 through 10, where he says that we do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will, that you might know what he says, what he wants in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, so that you can take God's word and you can apply it in your life with, a, with wisdom and understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord. That's the goal. Listen to this. Fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So we want to be fruitful in all that we do. Fully pleasing Him. That's holiness. We are shut up to Christ in that he is our only master. He is our Lord. The tempter who tempted Adam and Eve is not welcome in Christ's garden. We have renounced him. There is no place for him. Christ is the gardener, and it is he who has sealed us off for himself alone. He who is the one who has built a wall around us, who has sealed us by the Holy Spirit until the last day, that we might be His alone and not give ourselves to idols and to idolatry. Adam did not guard the garden, did he? But Christ has us safely enclosed that the wicked one cannot touch us. Actually, Paul goes on to explain this in Colossians. In the, in the very passage that I just quoted, he goes on with it. It's a really long sentence. When I spoke before about his prayer that we would be pleasing to him, being fruitful in every good work, he goes on to show how God gives us grace and strength to continue as his people that are looking to please him and to aiming to please him. He keeps us. Colossians 1.11, he says that we're strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long-suffering with joy. What, what is the patience and long-suffering? Well, when it's hard to do the will of God, when it's hard to live in a way that pleases Him because you've got deprivations in the world and things like that, 
He gives us patience and long-suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. So we, rather than becoming all downcast and thinking that we're getting a bad deal, we consider our inheritance. And we say, you know, we're partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us, he goes on, from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. So we've been moved from the kingdom of darkness where we serve idols and covetousness to the kingdom of light, the kingdom of His Son, from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption. Okay, we, we're delivered from the bondage of that old life and we're, we're, our sins are cleansed by His blood. So redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. A gardener protects his garden, doesn't he? A, a good gardener. He puts a wall around it, especially when it has precious fruit. Like this garden that we're talking about with this very rare and precious things that are growing in it. You don't want some animals coming in. You'd be worth it to hire someone to look after that thing 24-7. It, it is set apart from all that is around it there's it's it's distinguished as this is his garden and outside is not the garden uh we do this in our yard we we have a kind of a bit of a pitiful excuse for a garden in our in Timberley, not very good soil there you know we have we have a little bit of rock around it and it's marked off somehow there's going to be you know where the ground's plowed up or there's a little a little railroad tie or something or another that we're going to have to, to mark it off so that, you know, when our, when our boys go to mow, they don't just go mowing everywhere, you know, just right over the, right over the garden because it's no different than anywhere else. We're not going to get very, very good things growing there if we do that. So um, this is what God does, you see. He's, Christ sets us apart. Perhaps you can now see then how, going back to what we were talking about before, how we can be a fountain of water to supply others in the body while at the same time being sealed off and exclusively given to Christ. It makes sense, doesn't it? The fruit that we bear and the water that comes forth from us is all for Christ. He receives our fruit and he receives our river and is himself refreshed by it. But he also calls us to benefit the other members of the body within the garden. So as it says, we're a fountain of gardens. Like we bring water to the, gar- the bride that is, again, a complex bride. We bring water to others that, that brings forth blessing and, and refreshment. He wants us to speak the truth in love so that we may grow up into all things, into him who is ahead, even Christ. It's all for Christ. Now, you see, if, so if we weren't sealed off, what would we be doing? Then we would be speaking lies and hypocrisy. We would be leading people unto Satan or into the world or covetousness away from God. We would be enticing them away. But if we're all for Christ, then yeah, the water can be flowing out all over the place. But it's all for Him. We're sealed off to Him. We have to get the analogy right. We don't, we don't want to get too, too like mechanical with these analogies. The whole idea is that He separated us out to be his people and to be a holy people. And he preserves us and keeps us. He's put a wall about us, not so we can't minister anybody, but so that our ministry will be pure and holy instead of defiled. It will be about Christ. So we're sealed off, not not in that we do not minister to others or let them see our fruits, but in that now we belong to Jesus, our husband, and now our service is for him, all of it. No longer being directed by Satan, the world, the flesh, or idols. So he tells us that we are his enclosed garden and that we are his sealed fountain. So what does the true, how does the true bride respond when she is told this? Okay? When you're told you're Christ's garden, you're his walled-off garden, you're his exclusive garden, and you are his fountain, how does the bride respond? We respond with a strong desire to give ourselves completely to Him. We want what we do to be for Him. We want it to be pleasing to Him. So there's a twofold prayer here that we will receive, that, that He will receive our fruit, that, that 
our fruit will, will get to him, that it, will be, that it will come forth from us and be pleasing to him, get to him. So first we pray that the wind will cause our spices, all those things that are growing, there's rare spices and things, to flow out to him so he can enjoy them. Verse 16, we say, Awake, O north wind, and come, O south, blow upon my garden that its spices may flow out. Now, this prayer is perhaps a prayer to the Holy Spirit. In Scripture, the Spirit is often said to blow upon us because the word wind and the word spirit are the same words. In Greek, the word wind and the word spirit, it's the same word. In Hebrew, the word wind and the word spirit, it is the same word. Notice how she gives three requests here. First, that he would awake, then that he would come, and then that he would blow. We should ask the Spirit to awaken when he does not seem to be active concerning us. The Psalms are filled with requests to God to awaken and to look upon things, our situation. We should ask him to come when his presence has not been so very evident to us. We should always really be asking him to come. Not because he's not everywhere present, he is everywhere present, but because we want him to come and show us that he is nigh. The Bible speaks, for example, about the Spirit coming. What does that mean? I thought the Spirit was omnipresent. The Spirit is omnipresent. The Spirit is everywhere. But what did it mean when the Spirit came? It meant that the Spirit was working and manifesting Himself in a way that was distinctive here than it was over here. And of course, that's very true, isn't it? That that's what we mean by, by coming. And then we ought to ask Him to blow to bring his influence upon us so that the precious spices that Jesus loves to grow in his garden will be active so that they will flow out of us to him. It will do no good to have grace in our lives that is not put into exercise in ways that bring glory to God. You could have all kinds of, of love and potential to love, but if, it's not, if, if it doesn't do anything, then actually it's not really there. It needs to be something that is exercised. If, if your joy evaporates as soon as trouble comes and, it, and it, it, there's nothing there left of it, then there's a problem. You see, we want it to flow out, to, to be seen even in those times of trouble. We need God's Spirit to, to work in us. In Palestine, the destructive winds are the winds from the east and the west, and those are not mentioned here. This is what George Burroughs says about this. He says, the east wind is in Palestine generally withering and tempestuous. The west wind brings from the sea clouds of rain or dark, damp air. So it's not a very, very helpful kind of a wind. The north wind, though, is cooling and refreshing, its power being broken by the mountain chain of Lebanon. And the south wind, though hot, has its heat mitigated in the upland regions and is never stormy. So here we are asking the Spirit of God to bring in those influences of His to blow upon us that will make us bring forth those spices that our Lord can, can smell, as it were, that we will be a savor of, of, of uh, delight to Jesus Christ. We want, as Matthew Henry says here, pious and devout affections and holy, gracious actions that honor God and adorn our profession to flow from us. So we want the actions as well as the affections, the holy and devout affections and holy and gracious actions. Second, we pray that Christ, our husband, will come and eat the fruit that we have brought forth for him. Okay, so the first thing we're asking is that the wind would blow so that it would stir up these uh, these graces that are in us. And now we're praying that he would come and receive these, uh, these graces, that he would smell these smells, that he would eat. See, we could use all kinds of different, uh, different symbols here because again, this is, this is allegory. The rest of verse 16 is our invitation to him. We say, let my beloved come to his garden and eat its pleasant fruits. So here, the picture and the allegory is the bride eagerly offering herself to her husband. Some people say perhaps on her wedding night, she opens herself up fully to him to come and enjoy her as his delectable garden that 
belongs exclusively to him. She is his garden. She is for him. Some see this as a consummation of marriage here. She is delighted to give herself fully to her husband. So as the bride of Jesus, we live to please him. Our life is made full by pleasing him through the grace that he gives to us. We are ever looking to bring forth more fruit for him and to have him come and receive that fruit with joy. We want him to delight in us because he is our husband. Indeed, how happy we are when we're conscious of pleasing the Lord. Isn't that the times when you're the most happy, when you're, when you're serving the Lord and when you're doing things that are pleasing to Him and you have the joy of knowing that He is pleased with those things? This is, this is when our, our, our joy is made full. As it says, when we keep His commandments and He comes to us and He manifests His love to us, the Spirit comes and the, the bride, I mean, I mean the, the, the groom comes and the, um, and the Father comes. So as the bride of Jesus, we live to please him. In short, we say, O Lord, I am your garden and I am your fountain now. Come and take what you have produced in me with joy. For I am your new creation, created to bring forth what pleases you. Created to bring forth what I could not bring forth before because I was dead in my trespasses and sins. Come and eat the fruits that you love so much. They are yours, and I give them to you. And now let's look at the response of Jesus, our husband. When we offer ourselves to him, does he, does he look at us and go, eh, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> no, that's okay. You, you go on your way. Is that what he does? Not at all. He assures us, in fact, that he is already enjoying our fruit. Look at the first verse of chapter 5. He tells us that he has already come to us. He says, I have come to my garden, my sister, my spouse. He is so willing and eager to come that he's arrived before we even knew it. Like Jacob, you know, when he, he said, you know, surely the Lord is in this place. And I, the old version says, I knew it not. <laughs> That's quite, quite powerful. He is so pleased with the fruits. Jesus is so pleased with the fruits of his people that that he is with them. He is there delighting in them, and they don't even realize it before they even ask him. Now, does that mean that we, we don't need to bother to ask him to come then? No, it doesn't mean that. Of course not. We need to ask him to come because we don't perceive him as being there. And we want him to come and to make himself known to us. Like I said before, he's present all the time, but he's even delighting in us, but we want to know about that. We want him to come and manifest his love to us. He is gracious and kind, and his company is is much to be desired. We don't want him to be there, and we don't even know he's there. I mean, how do you enjoy a guest in your house if you don't even know they're there? Oh, when did you get here? Oh, I've been here for a week. Oh, I didn't know you were here. You know, you're staying off in the bedroom or something, you know, shut up or something. You don't. It's not, not very, you don't have a lot of good fellowship that way. It's right for us then as a loving bride to tell him that we very much desire his company. What's more, we want him to show us that he delights in the fruit that we offer to him. Because if we're believers, we're bringing forth fruit for him. We just are if we're real believers. And we want him to take it and eat it. And we want to know that he's pleased with it. I know how... Um, my, my wife loves to cook. I'm glad that she does. And uh, when she makes things, you know, she often says, oh, what, do you, what do you think? Do you like it better than last night? You know, she wants to know that it's pleasing, you know. So, okay, that's the first thing. Come, come to us. But he tells us uh, that he has not only come to us, but also that he has gathered the fruits that he loves from us. He says, I have gathered my myrrh with my spice. A gardener has a special joy, doesn't he? What does a gardener do when the crops start to come in and it gets time to begin to harvest some things? The gardener goes out and looks at his fruits. He inspects them and he says, look at that. 
Look at that. Look at that pumpkin that's growing over there. Look at, look at those apples that are growing on my tree. And uh, there's a time of, uh, the harvest is a time of joy and, and thanksgiving and praise. Seeing the goodness of God and rejoicing in the bounty that is there. So what did our Lord do? Did he do a lot of plowing and did he do a lot of planting? Did he have to do a lot of work? Yeah, he had to go to the cross. He had to do all of that. So now when there's fruit in the garden that is the result of all of his labor and his work, he cherishes that. It's a joyful time for him. So our Lord makes it plain that, that he had found fruit to gather that makes him glad. He is delighted with what he finds in his garden. Is stated before, often we don't realize that even the first beginnings of true spiritual fruits that we bring forth cause him to be ravished with us. Here is his new creation begun in us. The first fruits of the spirit in us that bring joy and gladness to him because he knows the potential. He knows where that life is going. He knows that that's the real deal that he is looking, however small and meager it may be. Here is the beginnings of true love, true joy, true patience and good, goodness, true gentleness. What was before wholly defiled and polluted and unclean, reprehensible in his sight, just a pitiful imitation of those fruits, he is now able to find true fruit, fruits of the Spirit that ravish his heart. That is our Lord. And he shows us also that he has found a lot of different kinds of fruit. He shows something of the comprehensiveness of it when he talks, when he presents everything in pairs in this passage. He says, my myrrh with my spice. Like I had, I had, I had these together. My honeycomb with my honey. My wine with my milk. He finds much here that he loves. He overlooks nothing. He could name different ones here, you see. But he's just looking around. Oh, look at them. Oh, the beans and the corn over here. And the, you know, all the, all the different things that are, are growing there. So he has already come, he says, and he has already gathered the fruit. We didn't even know it. And uh, that we have brought forth him. And, and that's not all, though. He also has already eaten the fruits of our garden. He's been enjoying them. He goes on to say in 5.1, I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I have drunk my wine with my milk. All the while, he's been enjoying our fruits, and we did not know it. What a keen interest he has in this. Because you see, again, here is the fruit of his work that he left the glories of heaven to procure. Here is the fruit of his work that he, the Son of God, went to the cross to bring forth. My brothers and sisters, you need to see this so that you will be encouraged to bring forth more fruit for him. I, say, I don't have very much. It doesn't take much. All it takes is the real thing, the real God-wrought fruit that he produces in our life. George Burroughs says, well would it be for us could we feel that the garden spot of Jesus in the whole universe is the heart of the saint and the graces of the soul are to him a source of more exquisite pleasure than to us are the most precious fruits of the choicest garden. How valuable would we feel with those graces to be, would we feel those graces to be with what care would we cherish and cultivate them for the, this blessed friend, not for self-gratification or self-interest, not for the applause of the world, but for the approbation and love of our God? I mean, how often do you even do things that are good deeds and your main concern is that other people notice and what they think of you and what they saw rather than I'm doing this for him, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You say, well, he wouldn't be much pleased with it because he knows all the flaws. And of course he knows the flaws, but he's delighted with that which is true, that which is spirit wrought that is in you. You need to see this, not just so you will be encouraged to bring forth fruit for him, as I was just saying, but also so that you'll have the joy of him as one who has this 
this, this gracious, gentle love that delights in his children and rejoices in the progress that they make. He wants you to have joy in his gracious acceptance of you, joy in him. He tells you that we are his workmanship. He is remaking us into his glorious image. If you are in Christ, the work has already begun and he has already been delighting in it for as long as you've been a Christian. And perhaps like Jacob, the Lord was in this place and I knew it not. He invites his friend to enjoy his bride with him. At the end of 5.1, he says, Eat, O friends, drink, yes, drink deeply, O beloved ones. So this is a summons to his friends to feast upon his bride, to drink her fountain and to feast upon her fruits, inviting his friends, in fact, to be inebriated with her, drunk. That's what the words drink deeply indicate. Now, this seems quite shocking in multiple ways, that he should be inviting his friends to feast upon his bride and that he should invite them to become inebriated with her. It is shocking until we remember that this is an allegory that speaks of spiritual things. Who are the friends here? Well, surely the angels are his friends. They rejoiced when he made the world. When the sons of God rejoiced when man was created in God's image and they, they shouted for joy. They rejoiced when Jesus was born in Bethlehem. They said to, that these were good tidings of great joy that shall be to all the people. Hallelujah, glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. They rejoice when one sinner repents. Surely they take great delight in the beauty of his bride as she brings forth fruit. That the bride that he is bringing forth, they watch with wonder and amazement as they see her being renewed in the image of God by the working of his powerful grace. These are the things that they desire to look into. They look at the garden with him and they receive the fruits and rejoice in the fruits that are there. Surely he also invites the bride to feast upon her own fruit. Remember again that she is a complex bride, one bride made up of many members, so that she is said to edify herself in love, which is an odd thing, isn't it? Edifying herself, because she's made up of multiple members. To encourage herself, she is said to disciple herself. She's supposed to teach herself to observe all things that he has commanded. And he promises to be with her always as she teaches herself these things. She is to admonish herself as one member admonishes another. Surely those who are busy seeking to feed God's people and to see the fruit grow, maybe you're a parent, maybe you're uh, an elder in the church or a minister in the church, whatever it may be, praying for the people of God, maybe you're a brother or sister that loves younger disciples that you want to minister and encourage to, you're praying for them. He invites you to delight in the fruit with him. It's being brought forth. Come, friends, you know, eat, rejoice, partake, see what is coming forth here. Think about Paul. Remember him with the Thessalonians and, and what he said that you are my joy and my crown of rejoicing. And he talked about seeing you, the joy of seeing you at the last day before the Lord, accepted of him, the bride that's presented him. Well, Paul is part of the bride too. But she's the friends are rejoicing, the friends of Christ like Paul and Barnabas and different ones who labored with him, co-laborers with him, are rejoicing and all the people are rejoicing. You know, there's the mother who, who begins to see the fruit in her child that she's been praying for and she sees tokens of that and it brings joy to her. And the father that, that sees his daughter starting to emerge and go forth to, to serve the Lord and to, to want to please him in her life. It becomes a very, a very special thing. Jesus does not wish to eat alone. And he will not eat alone. No, indeed, he has planned a great wedding feast on the day when his bride is presented to him in all her glory, adorned for her husband without spot or blemish. How our hallelujahs will rise in that day. How the angels will shout with joy and gladness. 
But you know, we can also enjoy that now as we rejoice in the progress and the growth of those around us, delighting in the work of God and engaging ourselves in that work. But in that day, at the end, Jesus will enter his tabernacle, the Holy of Holies, the Garden of Paradise, his garden with his fountain, and it will be his people whom he redeemed by his own blood. Remember that Ephesians tells us that the temple is, and Peter as well, that the temple is made up of living stones, that the apostles and prophets are the foundation and that the people make up and Jesus inhabits that temple and it is his garden where he takes great delight. And out of that garden, there comes forth a river of living water that goes forth and brings healing to the nations. The glory of the temple will be that the Lord is there surrounded by his adoring bride whom he has redeemed at the cost of his precious blood. There she is, the one that he loves. There he is, the one that she loves. Already he has come to us. Already he is gathering his fruits. Already he is feeding. But the greatest day of all is yet to come. What a joy and privilege for us then to give ourselves freely to him as his bride, both now and forever. We have been set apart to the Lord if we have been redeemed. We are a holy people to the Lord. We are called saints because we are his garden and we are his fountain. And we delight to see the the fruit and the growth that occurs in his bride. Please stand and let's give thanks to him. Gracious Heavenly Father, how grateful we are when we consider the great work that that you have done in order to bring forth a bride for yourself, a bride out of the ruined mass of mankind, a bride, an elect bride that you have chosen, one that had no merit of her own, but that in your graciousness, you set your love upon her. And we thank you, O Lord, that that you have made a, a great bride, that there are many who make up this bride and that she brings forth fruit that was completely unknown in the world after the fall, that she brings forth love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness, all centered in you, Lord, that is directed toward you, that is, is uh, established before you and, and is yours, Lord. It's, a, it's, it's unto you, for you are our God. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us, O oh Lord, that we would bring forth much fruit, that the Spirit would blow upon us, and that there would be fruit seen, Lord, in our lives, and that we would be able to encourage one another and be to one another as a fountain of living water, that we would be a fountain that is for Christ alone, and that we would be a garden for Him alone, that the fruit that we bring would not be the fruits of the flesh or the fruits of the devil or the fruits of the world, but that they would be the fruits of your Spirit. For you are our God and you are our Redeemer. Purge us then, Lord, from all of these other things that we may be devoted to you and that we may bring pleasure to you. We pray that as you find pleasure in us and our fruit, that we would find pleasure in being fruitful to you. Lord, give us a greater love for you and a greater sense of your love for us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated as we prepare to come to the table. The wonderful fact that our Lord greatly delights in the fruit that we bring forth ought to make us very glad to give ourselves wholly to him. He will always welcome us because he has redeemed us. We're accepted in the beloved. We're accepted in Christ. Those who are his bride know quite well that we are completely unworthy to be accepted by him. He has shown us clearly the truth about our sinful condition and how it makes us deserving of eternal punishment in hell. And that's true 
of every person without exception. We deserve to go to hell. We know that the only way anyone can be saved is by trusting in Jesus who was crucified for sinners. That's why he was crucified. He will receive us only if we come to him as sinners, looking to him alone to redeem us. If we are true Christians in that way, we understand that and we trust in him alone for our salvation. But what is hard for us to believe, we know all that, but what is hard for us to believe that as those who have been redeemed by him, he is now ravished with even the first beginnings of new life that he finds in us, the life, the new life that he gives us. We know that we still come very short of what we ought to be, and it's hard to think that he would rejoice over the little bit of fruit that we have. But he does. In coming to the Lord's table, we are to examine ourselves, aren't we? And we're often going to find things when we examine ourselves that aren't all that attractive. We will see a lot that's wrong with us. But if we are his, we will see that there is some devotion there. There's some devotion there. There's some commitment there. There's some love there. There's some fruit that has been given to us by his grace, some joy. There's some patience. There's some, something that he has wrought in us. We should be extremely happy when we think about this and what we have learned today. The fruit, meager as it may be, would not be there at all if Christ had not died for us. Not one bit of it would be there. The, this fruit, meager as it may be, would not be there if he had not transformed us by the mighty working of his Holy Spirit to, to, to bring forth that fruit by blowing upon us even as the Spirit to bring forth more fruit. This fruit, meager as it is, is cherished by him. And that should draw out our love, that he takes great delight in us and the progress that we make. Let us then come to the table and rejoice that Jesus died for us and was raised again for our justification because the Father has accepted his sacrifice for our sins. You see, this is where we are able to see what he did, which he sets before us in order that we might belong to him and that we might bear fruit that pleases him. We could not do that if Jesus had not come in the flesh, died on the cross, broken body, and shed blood. What is represented here? We would not know fruit whatsoever, but now he delights in this fruit. So let's find joy as we come to the table. We look to what he did that's represented here in order that we might bring forth more fruit. We look for forgiveness of the sins that we commit, and we also look for more fruit, more life that comes because he was crucified for us through the blood of the covenant. Listen now to the words of institution from Mark 14, 22. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Assuredly, I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So you see that he's looking forward to that future feast that he will have with us when we will be with him again physically. But until then... He has given us this so that we can keep before us what, so he can keep before us what he has done for us. What is the foundation of all of our hope is that Jesus died for us and was raised again for our justification. So you may eat and drink at this table only if you're trusting in Jesus for forgiveness through his death and are looking to bring forth fruit for him by his grace. If you're actually someone who doesn't really care to bring forth fruit, then even if you're professing otherwise, then you shouldn't come. You should repent of that so that you're eager, that you're desirous to bring forth fruit. Even if you're struggling to bring forth fruit, you say, I don't do very well. That's all the more reason to come if you desire to have the fruit. If you don't care about it, though, you're not even wanting to have the fruit, then it's hypocrisy to come to feed on something that you don't want to have. And you need to first repent. Uh, you must also be a communicant member in good standing of a faithful church. 
If not, then that needs to happen first. And uh, we do uh, we do welcome uh, Joanna today to the table for the first time. I'm very thankful that she has been received. So let's ask the Lord to uh, to bless us. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we come before you now, we ask you, O Lord, that you would bless the bread and the wine that is on this table. For Christ has instituted that these elements would be set apart to represent his broken body and his shed blood. And we thank you that he came into the world in order that he might establish a kingdom of righteousness. And we thank you that as those who have trusted in him, who have put ourselves into his hands to bring salvation to us through his merit and through his um, sacrifice, we have confidence that we are now righteous and standing because of him. We also have confidence that you are working in us to bring forth fruit in us and that we have been anointed with the Holy Spirit. And we pray, Lord, that the fruit of, that, of the Spirit's work would indeed be, be evident in us, that you would blow upon us, Lord, and that we would see new life and growth and that there would be um, a sweet savor that would would go forth from us with the fruits that you have that you have wrought in us, and we pray, Lord, that we would delight to to belong to you and to give ourselves to you. That we would be like a bride who is just very very pleased to to give herself wholly to her husband, and we pray, Father, that that you would be glorified in us. We do pray, Lord, as we're mindful of how short we have come and, and how ungrateful we have been. We do look to you for the ongoing cleansing and forgiveness of our sins. Father, we know that we are unworthy of the least of your mercies. And yet in Christ, we have been made worthy. And we thank you that because of his merit and his work, that we have been fully justified. And we pray, Lord, that 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 delight in Christ would would grow stronger and stronger in us. And we pray that he would continue to delight in the fruit that is in us. And may we be conscious of that. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So you may eat and drink as soon as the tray is passed to you. And then I'll ask Elder Ray Silver to give thanks for what we have received. According to the holy institution, command, and example of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I take this bread, and having blessed it, break it and give it to you. Take, eat, this is the body of Christ which is given for you. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, 
neither can you unless you abide in me. According to the holy institution, command, and example of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I also take this cup and give it to you. This cup is the new covenant in the blood of Jesus Christ, which was shed for the remission of the sins of many. Drink from it, you who are trusting in him. Jesus continued, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this table that you've given, where we can picture your, your body and your blood that was shed for us. And to realize, Lord, that this was a great work of yours to work true and precious faith in us, that you have sought us to be your bride in spite of who we were, in spite of our past. And so we marvel, Lord, at your grace. And we see at, at this table here, as we look at the Song of Solomon, we just see how you rejoice over your church. Lord, how you rejoice over those that you've chosen and saved and worked grace in. And we marvel at that. So we're so thankful, week by week, as we take part in communion, to see your work in us and to joy in your salvation in the great work that you have done in spite of ourselves. So Lord, bless us, we pray. We pray that the, the Holy Spirit, the wind, would blow on us and that more fruit would come, more love and joy and peace. Lord, we pray that you would work those works in us. We admit oftentimes we don't have the desire for that. And so, Lord, we look to you even for the desire to have more fruit and then for you to do the work to, to produce that fruit. Lord, bless us. As you think about your word that feeds us, as you think about the bread and the wine that feeds us here also. Lord, bless us by your grace and your mercy. And we're just totally assured, Father, your love and your, your sustaining of us and your care and your protecting of us. Bless us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we're going to sing Psalm 45, but I want to say a few things about it before we do. Um, sometimes, sometimes people will wonder about why we don't sing the song of Solomon at church. Why don't it is a song? Why don't we sing it? And there is a reason for that. And that is that we understand that God has given us a collection of songs in our Bible to sing when we gather for worship. And those are the book of praises or the Psalter, as we call it. 
And uh, there, are other, there are other songs in the Bible, but they aren't suited for regular, um, regular Christian worship or worship of God's people in the assembly. And the way we come to that, um, that conclusion in part is because there are songs like Psalm 96, for example, that you can find in, I believe it's Chronicles, and uh, there's a lot of psalms like that that you can find in other books. And when God wanted them to be in the collection that is gathered together for our use as a book of praises, then he had them repeated in the Psalter. And uh, the ones that he didn't choose, like Miriam's song when they came out of Egypt or something like that, he didn't choose to include. He included uh, Psalm 90 that Moses wrote and probably Psalm 91 that he also wrote. So uh, that's why we, um, we, aren't, we aren't trying to put the Song of Solomon to, to music. We have, in fact, this Psalm 45 that we've been singing that is very much has the same themes And it actually ties together even more helpfully for us all of these things because it shows us that clearly that that Jesus Christ is the husband who takes the bride and rejoices in her and who has the all the um, he, he, he rejoices in all the savor of the spices and the things that are there. And it talks about how um, that his throne is not just a temporary throne, but it's, he's the one that has the throne that's forever and ever. He's called Elohim, oh God, your throne is forever and ever. And uh, of course, that's quoted in Hebrews to show that he is higher than the angels, that he is the one who is the very son of God. So we learn so much of our, of our bridegroom here in this song, but we see the same things. We see him delighting in her beauty. You know, the things that we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, it, You've ravished my heart. You know, that kind of thing. The king is there rejoicing in his bride that is being brought to her. So let's then sing together Psalm 45. And we are singing the one that's pasted in the back.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this worship service that we're able to have. We look forward to the next one as well, Lord, and may your word work in our hearts and in our minds and help us to be attentive to it, Lord. We also help our pray that you help us to trust in you for all things, both spiritual and physical, the things that we need, Lord. We know that we can only get the things that we need through you. We pray for your blessing upon our time of food and fellowship downstairs, Lord. And we ask that you accept our tithes and offerings and help us to further your kingdom through your use. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Receive now the blessing of the Lord our God. May God make you worthy of his calling. And may he fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.